Hello. Just getting my headphones set up here. Let me check if they're on. Uh, they're not. If this is working, can you uh, please send me a message or something? Or uh, let's say put some likes in the chat. Okay, my settings tell me that it's working, so I'm gonna go. Hello, good evening folks. It's been a little while since I did one of these videos. Hey Kim, hey Tim, what's up Rick? Man, this is uh, something, eh? There's, there's a lot of financial stress happening with the coronavirus and thankfully that it's it's not a a health crisis because we took drastic action to stop the spread of coronavirus for the most part we're seeing data come out of uh, bc that it's not going to turn into a black plague level <laughs> spanish flu pandemic level level event and it's because we had to shut everything down um and we sort of uh, kept people home and and flattened the curve but the problem with that is it's going to bring a lot of economic pain and we're aware of that we were talking about that early and um i've been thinking and i have some ideas on how how you can maybe benefit from the bottom that's happening or the the drop in prices and stuff that's going to happen if you're in a position to be able to have any cash that you can invest or or whatever and I, I wanted to try to think about ways that the average person can come out of this better than they went into it or at least survive it and not lose a lot of money hey john um doug what's up ryan so if anybody has any specific questions you can pop them in there but there's one strategy that i learned today or learned yesterday actually from a friend of mine garrett gunderson he wrote he's in this group uh mastermind talks that i'm in and he wrote a book called uh killing sacred cows and it's all about the financial markets and investments and investing in yourself and in, in a business and he's a he's a bitcoin guy he was on my podcast i didn't release the episode though because we were both really drunk we were in mexico on a, on a in cabo and we both got too drunk so when i listened back to the the tape i was like this is not good <laughs> it's really good content but it's not good for the brand because we were both just too drunk so we're gonna have to do another podcast me and garrett but he gave us some really good advice uh yesterday that 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 i think really applies to a lot of people that are kind of like maybe in a middle class situation um hey adrian lee maria thanks for joining me on this saturday night what's up johnny Okay, so the strategy that I think is going to work well for most people is, oh, well, first of all, any, any government bailout stimulus that's being offered, you should 100% try to get that. There's, some of it is kind of scammy, like the mortgage payments, like the banks are suspending more mortgage payments. I mean, that's kind of not really, they're not really doing you a favor. They're, they're actually like, suspending your mortgage payments but then baking in all the interest and payments into the end of the the term like after the six months you're gonna end up paying for it anyway so it's not like you're getting six months of no mortgage payments you're, you're getting a like uh suspension of payments but it's it, it's get it gets added back on so so like you got to be careful with some of the things but obviously like there's like the two thousand dollars a month uh benefit that the canadian government is offering you definitely want to make sure to take that. So set up, uh, I think it's Canada.gc or, or the CRA's website, and you can go into my account and then uh, get ready to file. I think they said in a couple of days they're going to be ready to accept applications. And Trudeau said that they hired 13,000 people to process the applications because there was a million or something people applied for, for this relief. So if you're self-employed, if you're a contract worker, um, if you're a, a worker who's been laid off, um, you can apply for this benefit, this EI benefit, and it'll it'll be like four months or so, I think. So, yeah, first of all, any kind of thing that the government is announcing that they're going to do to help people, you should 100% take advantage of that. Now, most people are in a financial situation where that $2,000 a month is not really going to be life-changing money. It, it's It's like 
you know, nobody's going out to the movies, nobody's going to the bar, no one's doing all these frivolous expenses right now, everything's, we're all in quarantine, so, so you have a lot of disposable income that you're not spending right now, and that's another thing that everybody should do, you should cut your disposable income, if you still have subscriptions to things that, like, maybe you don't need right now, you should, you should 100% get those, uh, I can't turn, Mitchell says, can you turn your screen to a tropical of plant for some extra fun but this isn't zoom i wish i could i don't know how to do that on on a facebook video maybe let, let me see here does anybody know how to do that how to change your background on a facebook video let's see i can put some ha ha faces maybe some of these things i can put a mask on myself what the heck? Okay, hold on. How do I get rid of these now? Anyways, I'll try that another time, Mitchell. So, yeah, it's, it, reduce reduce your expenses. That's the one thing. You got to tighten things up now because this is not over. And if you... I just I, I want to bring everybody to the same understanding. I'm trying to go, like bring everyone to my line of thinking of why I think the next step that I'm going to advise you to do and the cutting down of your expenses is is the smart idea. Now, the government is going to try as much as possible to stimulate the economy and give you money. The government is going to go into debt and do deficit spending and probably raise taxes and it, all in a big effort to try to uh, to stimulate the economy and keep everybody floating, right? But this is uh, this is the greatest drop, the quickest drop in stock market history. It dropped faster and steeper than than it did during the depression, and it's not quite as deep as some of the other financial recessions but it just happens so fast like this happens so fast so it's not over likely it's not over and the reason why we think it's not over like people following this closely is because there was a lot of excess value in the stock markets there was like the the significant majority of the value of the stock market since Trump has been elected was driven by um, the Trump tax cuts and corporate bonds being used to buy back stock. So, for example, Boeing was, you know, Boeing, the, the, the company that made those jets that had to stop being produced because they were falling out of the sky, that Boeing, its stock went to like $300 from let's see, I'm going to look it up exactly now. It was a massive, it was a massive rise in, and their stock was the majority, the majority of their stock rise was due to buybacks. And what buybacks is, it's a, uh, it's a kind of complicated financial voodoo scam that everybody on the S&P, like all the stocks, the major stock markets, um, geez, market watch is down. <laughs> People are, I can't find Boeing stock. Okay, here we go. Yeah, uh, Adrian said it went from 350 to, to 95. I'm then back to 180. Yeah, I'm looking for over the last, say, eight years since the last term of Obama and the first term of Trump, um, what the stock was. Okay, so let's see. So, okay, so Obama's last term, $75. So basically, in eight years, because of stock buybacks, the profits of the company didn't increase 20 times. But they went from $70 all the way up to $350. And then on, they're calling it Black Thursday, the, the, the huge crash, like the quickest crash in history. It went down to nine, or 50 or so, was it? 90? Something like that. So it was a crazy drop. It was this really significant drop. And then even at that low price, it's overvalued. Because if you look at the earnings of the company, 
Um, and I was explaining this to my friend Ron yesterday. He came over to pick up a weight set from me because uh, I'm using this new X, X, uh, X3 bar, which is just military strength industrial uh, bands. And you use a, an Olympic bar and it gives you a lot of resistance. So I don't use my weight set anymore. So Ron needed a weight. So I brought it over and then we, we got to talking about this. And Ron's not a finance guy. He's not in the stock market. He's not, he's not one of those people. And I'm not really either. I'm more of a Bitcoin guy, but I do follow the markets for the last four or five years because it's just fascinating to see how this Ponzi is is uh, continuing to to go up. And when you look at the fundamental value of this, the average person just it's just like mind boggling because the value of Boeing stock right now, when you look at the earnings, so how much money they make and then how much their stock is trading for, it's like 20 times their earnings last year and you know for last quarter and that's if you factor in how much they lost like flights drop 95 percent so boeing's earnings are going to go down like 95 percent this last quarter and they're probably not going to come back for a year uh significantly and boeing's already been in trouble because boeing was the company that had the flight the the uh, planes all fall out of the sky uh what's up steven weaver and jillian and pam um Tim is saying, with life expectancy going up, we can justify P.E. ratios higher than we traditionally use to value companies. Um, that's an interesting thought. I mean, the way that Garrett talked to me about it when we were talking in Cabo about, about this on our podcast made a lot of sense. He said that... He said that... Um, you know, when you think about if as an investor, if you're going to invest in a local business, you're going to like maybe invest at a 5x valuation, probably a 3x. You you know, if you're going to buy a local restaurant or or invest in a local startup or something like that, you're going to invest, you're going to look at their earnings and you're going to have a, a reasonable expectation uh, to give them more than what they're worth, probably by 3 to 5x. Boeing at the top in, in the 300s was like 40x. And so it's like the insiders are making all the money here because by the time a company goes public and gets listed on the stock market, all that really significant value has already been earned by the insiders. But the example of Boeing is is exacerbated more because it's not only just it's not only just that stock buybacks pumped the shares, it's that they got the money from taxpayers. So taxpayers' money goes into retirement funds. And retirement accounts need to earn like 6% a year to, to meet their obligations for, for their future promises to what they're going to pay the people that are, you know, in like the teacher's fund and stuff like that. When you retire, you get paid out of those, those funds. So what these corporations started to do was issue a massive amount of bonds. So they raised billions and billions of dollars of bonds, corporate bonds, which is just like, instead of issuing more stock, which would lower the price of the stock because there's now more supply of the stock, instead of issuing more stock and raising that way, they issue loans, they take loans, right? They, they take debt. And then the money is significantly all coming from taxpayer money. It's these retirement funds. And so billions and billions of dollars has been going, getting pumped into stocks like Boeing through bonds. And this is, not, this is money that's not being spent on researching new, new engines and anti-gravity flight and stuff like that. It's not like uh, Tesla, you know, Elon Musk is inventing like would, would he, if it was Elon Musk, he'd be inventing electric jets and stuff. It's not like Boeing is doing that. Boeing is taking the majority of their cash and pumping their stock with it. They're buying back their stock. So by keeping the stock the stocks scarce, the amount of stocks the same, there's there's a a demand by them with their own cash to pump the stock and the stock goes up. It's not like there's increase in the value of the company or increase in value of the stock. It's actually just a ponzi. It's like you know, it's the, they get zero fundamental value out of these buybacks. It's all majority driven by the Ponzi is just a kind of funny word to say. It's not a Ponzi, obviously the, the definition of a Ponzi is, is like a, an investment scheme where 
you know, the, the investors that are coming in at the bottom pay for the investors at the top. Life insurance or, or, or retirement, you know, uh, funds, that's a Ponzi. <laughs> So, so the money that you are expecting to get from the government when you retire is being paid for by the new generation. That's a Ponzi. So the pension, the public pensions, the, like that's a Ponzi. Um, so anyways, this, the, the, the point is that Boeing at now at $180 is still overvalued by probably 10x or, or sorry, probably by, by two to three X because realistically you'd want to have like tim said like yeah you can justify a high price to earnings ratio because life expectancy is going up and whatever but having it at like 40x price to earnings ratio is just not there's no there's no real value there so there's a significant amount of companies have been doing this and this used to be illegal up until the 80s and they changed the rules in the 80s it used to be considered stock manipulation it was illegal to do stock buybacks and they changed it, and like Bernie Sanders and AOC have been ra ra you know rally rallying against stock buybacks, and I don't I don't think stock buybacks are bad in 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 the um, the idea that you can buy back stocks, because my friend Jeremy Hendon had told me this great line of thinking on this yesterday when we were we were kind of debating this in a chat, and he's like, you know, this is just a natural thing, buying back stock, issuing dividends, it's kind of the same thing. It gives value to the investors who are invested in the company, invest in the stock. And while I, I don't have a problem with stock buybacks, and I think dividends are fine, stock buybacks are fine, but the problem is when the significant majority, like 90% of the value of the rise in the price of the stock is because of stock buybacks and it comes from taxpayer money in public you know, RS, um, retirement funds funneling money into the stocks and then the executives earn 30% of that money in bonuses and, and insider stocks and options and all that. That's a scam. I'm sorry. Like there, there's nothing other than like that is rich people, elite rich people destroying the value of the taxpayers retirement money and milking money from the public and milking money from people that are going to end up re being retired broke probably because they, they do too much risk and they, so they pumped the stocks with this money and they took out something like $5 billion from this money that came in. And that's just insane. Like they're getting it. So, so their stock went from 380 to like 70 or 80 or $90 during black Thursday, the crash is a huge drop. And then they announced that they're getting bailed out. They're getting bailed out with, with public money. So not only did they, not only did they use public money, to juice the stocks up and and take out five billion dollars from from taxpayers and retirement funds, but they're not losing anything. These executives for these big giant companies that took on this crazy, that took on all these all this debt and 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 like didn't provide any value back are getting bailed out now. It's insane. They should not be getting bailed out with taxpayer money. The, it's we don't live in a system right now of free market capitalism. So when you hear people that are like for socialism say capitalism doesn't work, it it kind of irks me because this is not capitalism. We're not living in a world of capitalism right now. We're living in a world of corporatism and favoritism and counterfeit capitalism. It's like it, it's like the government is doing no bid contracts with companies like Boeing to build missiles that then then they'll sell to like Saudi Arabia so they can bomb Yemen. Like that's why the government is bailing out bailing out um Boeing. It's because they get a lot of their, you know, it's a defense it's a defense contractor basically. Like so it's it's just frustrating to see these companies get bailed out when they've been so precarious with with their money and and regardless of all the philosophical things it's overvalued. It's still way overvalued. Their price to earnings ratio now is going to be like 40 X. So, and it's not just Boeing. I'm just picking on Boeing because Boeing is one of the big, the big examples the, you know, the, the airlines recently were saying like after record profits for, for since like 2011 to like 2016, I think it was the United Airlines CEO said, we will never lose money again. And they were sitting on billions of dollars in cash. And they said, we will never lose money again. <laughs> so uh, obviously, like, if this was capitalism, 
companies like Virgin and and Boeing would go under because they took too, took too much risk. They should have had that cash to be able to weather this storm. That's what you would do in your business. You would have enough cash to be able to try to weather a storm. And sure, the government can come in and try to help out. But when the government was propping up, I mean, when the companies were propping up their stock prices and sending them flying just because uh, of doing stock buybacks, not because of creating value or doing research or anything valuable like that, then it doesn't make sense to bail it out. Like, I would rather see... I would rather see these guys fail and then a new company start up. That's capitalism. The risk gets purged. If you took this risk and it didn't pay off, then then it gets purged from the system. Then a company fails and the investors in this company would lose their money or they would get, you know, they would this company would get bought out and then you would you'd be down 50% anyways because the company get bought out. But that's not what we're happening. We have a, that's not what's happening. We have a situation here where Companies and banks become too big to fail, and they know it. They know that once they get big enough, the government's going to bail them out. So they take on excess risk, and they, they do whatever they can to take advantage of the system so that they know when they get in trouble, they're going to get bailed out. And the executives never lose any money. All these people that took all this risk and don't lose any money, they get bailed out by taxpayers. And it's kind of ridiculous. I mean, I wish I had a print money printer like that. Well, don't you? Don't you wish you had a, a, you know, the government could just send us all a little money printer and bail us all out? Like, here's $100,000 you can print yourself. <laughs> They're going to send us money, for sure. They're going to send us money, but it's not going to be as much as these guys are getting. And, oh, I know my, my chat stopped scrolling, so I noticed there's a bunch of more people on here. And I, I kind of got rambling on the stock market, but the reason why I was talking about that is because I want people to be on the same page as me when it comes to understanding how overvalued things are still, even though we had this massive drop. Because I think there's still going to be a massive drop, and I want people to be able to come out of this ahead. And, you know, as an average person, if you've got a lot of money in the bank, you're not an average person, Right. You know, you can do things like invest in, in funds and stuff near the bottom, slowly allocate into assets like gold and, and Bitcoin and real estate and stuff like that. But the average person is just is is not in that situation. They don't have a lot of money. So I'm hoping to give some advice to the average viewer here, my average Facebook friend here that that's kind of like struggling and probably has debt and maybe they have a mortgage, but they don't have investments. Um, I think people like that can actually benefit from this and come out better in the end. Uh, and I'll tell you why once I read these chats here. So Matthew said, well, our current fiat currency isn't backed by anything and can't be, can be printed indefinitely according to the Federal Reserve. Bitcoin at least has a, limited, has a limit to what is minted slash circulated. So he was referring, Kyle was uh, re referring to Jeff's joke about Bitcoin as a Ponzi. Um, I'm, you know, I'm using the word Ponzi loosely. Obviously, the the uh, an actual Ponzi scheme is like a criminal uh, endeavor to to scam investors. Like Bernie Madoff was the chairman of the New York Stock Exchange, and he ran a real Ponzi for for a long time and suckered in a lot of people. That that was actually a Ponzi. He was claiming he was investing and getting like two percent a year or something like that, or four percent a year, or whatever steady returns. And he was actually just generating fake returns from the new investment money that was coming in. And he wasn't doing any economic activity. He wasn't investing. He was just running a straight up Ponzi. I mean, you know, the, the, like. I'm just kidding about when I say Ponzi. I'm just you, it just pisses me off. So I use that term. Um, but yeah, Bitcoin's not an investment scheme either. Bitcoin is not Bitcoin is an asset. It's like saying, oh, yeah, gold is a Ponzi or you know, you could make the Ponzi logistical or logical argument about anything, really. You could probably convince yourself that. Like, going to work is a Ponzi. Paying for your taxes is a Ponzi. <laughs> you, could, you could say anything is a Ponzi. Uh, Ryan said, where do you think the safest place in the world is right now, all things considered? If, you, if you're talking about, like, physically, I like Canada, honestly. I think we, I think we took enough action quick enough that we're going to prevent our healthcare system from being overwhelmed. Um, we're gonna, we're gonna, you know, it's not like the United States where you're gonna have all these crazy medical bills if you do catch coronavirus and you're maybe one of the 5% of people that have complications and you have to go to the hospital. If you're in the U.S., you're kind of worried about it. So you're gonna have to maybe pay $40,000 in healthcare costs. You know, your, your hospital, your ambulance ride, you know, is gonna cost $10,000. So I kind of like being in Canada. I think we're, I think we're good here. We also have like a decent economy. Um, I think, I think we're good in Canada. 
Uh, but I prefer the way that Singapore and South Korea have handled everything because they're doing more testing and they're doing like uh, more open communication with their citizens. So they're telling people where the cases are, how you can avoid them. They didn't completely shut everything down. They're just shutting down areas that have outbreaks. And uh, yeah, I like Singapore, South Korea for they've got good health healthcare systems as well. But yeah, I think I think we're good here. Hey, Jason, I don't know if you're still watching. Uh, let's see, who else we got? Timothy says, there's two sides to every trade, though. Someone is happy to sell to Boeing, so it should be balanced by the fewer number of shares in circulation. I get that it burns their cash and can't be used to cover their operational woes, especially in a crisis. Yeah, Tim, like I said, I'm not against stock buybacks by by the idea of doing stock buybacks as a as a a benefit to shareholders and like a way to distrib- like increase the value of the shares, but when the majority of your share, of your share value comes from doing stock buybacks for 8 years spending billions of taxpayer money and and like the significant majority of the gains in the stock price is just because of a uh, market manipulation, that's not good because it it causes major crashes. And the, and the majority of the S&P have been doing that. And that's why I think, and not just me, a lot of people think that there's a lot more down to come. There's a crazy amount of debt out there and they're all needing to get bailed out. So that means that these are not good companies if they all need to get bailed out. Um, so likely there's going to be another big drop and you want to be positioned for that drop so that you can kind of benefit from it. Hey, Shannon, Daniel. Brittany and Liz, lots of people watching. Well, actually, there's not a lot right now. I think people click on it and it tells me they're here and then they go away. <laughs> Nobody wants my advice. <laughs> uh, Tim said, Boeing, I think, is a bad example because their flights being subsidized to support middle America and then also with their defense contracts. Yeah, Boeing was what was like the egregious example. Their shareholder, their executive team got four or five billion dollars from these, uh, from this, this, this scheme. So that's the most egregious one. There's plenty of them that are like that. The banks are all like that too. Um, anybody that needs a bailout right now and takes all this government subsidy money and and all that, like, it's just to me, it's it's not real capitalism. And it's just kind of sickening to watch all this risk be taken and then they just get bailed out and they don't have any consequences. And it gets put on, you know, f- the taxpayer foots the bill. And the, and not only that, but it's still overvalued. Their their share is, is still overvalued, significantly overvalued, like two or three X overvalued. And once the real effects of the, the, the coronavirus, like, hit America and Canada, it's going to cause another spook and it's going to probably drop the markets quite a bit more. That's, that's what my assumption is. Like we're going to go down some more, another maybe 30, 40%. Um, but that, you know, you gotta be conservative with moving in and out of your investments. You don't want to just go all out and go all in. So there's good ways to, to handle this, but, uh, Let's see. Jeff said, problem with not bailing out the likes of Boeing is the immediate impact of 550 to 100K employees losing their livelihood. And then all the auxiliary employees that would be affected that had affiliation with giant companies like that. Yeah, that makes sense. But that's capitalism. Like, that's how it works. If you're going to start a company and then you're going to charge ridiculous rates for flights and you're going to make planes that fall out of the sky then you should probably lose some money <laughs> and another company should be started up and that company can hire those 50,000 employees because there's not like there's it's not like there's less demand for planes well there is right now <laughs> obviously but there will you know in a year or so it'll come back like the the travel industry will come back but it shouldn't be the same idiots that took all this risk and built all these faulty pl- like Boeing rushed Boeing was aware that there was a problem with their planes. Boeing knew that there was a problem with the software. And instead of training the pilots, they rewrote the software so that it would hack the early takeoff problem so that it would just take over from the pilot. And that's what caused the planes to start falling out of the sky because the pilots didn't understand the the reason why the controls weren't responding and they would try to fight them. And then that would cause the plane to fall out of the air. 
and 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 it came out that Boeing knew this was happening, and they instead of wanting to pay the cost of training all the pilots on this this problem, they just figured they would just sweep it under the rug and like rewrite the software, and then they started to want to try to charge companies or yeah, charge the airlines for the software upgrade. So I mean, Boeing is not. I I don't want to defend Boeing. Boeing is a ridiculous company. Okay, what else we got? Okay. That makes, uh, Johnny said, if things don't collapse because of this coronavirus situation, I think it's only a matter of time. Debt is too available and many Canadians are maxed. The economy is slow to start up. Is If the economy is slow to start up, it could be an interesting ride. Debt, with, you know, in quotes with, or in brackets with the stock market, was an issue with the Great Depression as well. What's your thoughts? So, I've been reading a little bit about the Great Depression because I'm trying to like wonder, are we going into another Great Depression? I'm always trying to think about the edge cases and be prepared for things. And, you know, this is this is like the fastest crash in history. And uh, I'm going to get to my advice. I'm just reading through these comments. But I do have some good advice for people if they do want to stick around or whatever and wait for me to finish the, the answering the questions and talking about it. Hopefully people find this interesting. Otherwise... Um, I guess go back to uh, to scroll on Instagram or watching YouTube. <laughs> That's what I've been doing the last little bit. But so Johnny's Johnny's saying like what what is what is my thoughts on the Great Depression? I've been trying to understand that. There's this uh, a friend of mine, Phil Caravaggio. He helped or he worked with Ray Dalio, who's like a billionaire investor. Work on this book, Principles. We convinced him to write this book, Principles, or whatever. But Phil, I met through this group, this entrepreneur group, Mastermind Talks, which is amazing. I meet so many cool people through there. Probably like five or six of the viewers now are in, in Mastermind Talks. Um, and they know me all as the crazy Bitcoin guy, the crazy coronavirus guy. Um, and then probably five Bitcoiners watching me. And then some friends and family. So we've got a nice little mix of viewership. So, yeah, th the thing that I th I don't think it's going to be depression because in during the Great Depression it was a similar it was a similar sort of situation where it was work related and it wasn't like um, virus related it was like people couldn't find work but it was because the banks all over the all over the nation sort of had a credit crunch right like they 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 didn't have enough money some of them and they couldn't they didn't have a system to loan to each other and provide liquidity. So the the other thing was the banks during the during the depression in the 30s they were not able to create money from thin air because there was a gold standard. So the US Constitution was created in what was it the 1790s or something like that or whatever it was but but when they created it it was it said in the constitution that states could not create money and only gold and silver were legal tender back at that time and the reason why they put that in the constitution was because before the revolutionary war just before the revolutionary war the colonies created their own co their own money called the continental dollar and the continental dollar was like a fiat currency and a fiat currency is just a money by decree that's what that means it's just like we say it's money so you know it is and and that's what it we tried fiat money before uh and the fiat money always ends up losing because politicians become in charge and politicians will want to print too much of it and then it ends up becoming devalued and people will just turn to scarce assets like gold and stuff because they can't print more gold. So the continental dollar, they used that to finance the Revolutionary War against Britain. And um, what Britain did was actually really clever. They created, they, they counterfeited the continental dollar and flooded the colonies with these fake continental dollars and it and it caused hyperinflation of the the currency because not only was the US government you know the colony government at the time creating continental dollars to fund the war effort against the British but the British was sending counterfeit money into the colonies and that inflated the value and nobody wanted to take it anymore it was like they would just want gold um so 
after they learned the lessons of, um, and you know, companies and banks and stuff could issue their own currencies back then. And, and when they wrote the constitution, they decided that they were going to make it illegal, constitutionally illegal for, uh, for, for, for anybody, politicians and states to make their own currencies. So only gold and silver was, was money. So before the, before, back in the depression, the dollar was still tied to gold. Um, paper money was back then it, it was redeemable for ounce of, or a, a, a certain amount of gold and silver. I think it was actually just gold at that time. So during the depression, the way that they could have got out of the depression was to stimulate the economy and print money and, and make loans and stuff and to, to like to prevent companies like Boeing from going under. So they, they're, they're, they're walking this tight line between trying what Jeff said, trying not to make companies go under and have 50,000 people lose, lose their jobs and not encouraging hyperinflationary behavior of where the currency loses all value. But I mean, it's a tough, it's a tough job because they, they're about to print like $10 trillion in the United States. And there's only you know, in when two thousand and and when nine eleven happened, I think the the total amount of U.S. money in the world was like eight trillion dollars, and now they're about to print. You know, since Obama years and Trump years, it's up to twenty four trillion dollars. Now they're about to print another ten trillion by the time this is uh, another year goes by. Probably even more. It's probably going to be twenty by the time this is completely finished in a couple of years. So the amount of money supply is just ever increasing, and in Weimar Germany. After World War Two, World War One, um, Germany was printing tons and tons of money as well, because they thought that they were going to be able to win the war, and then they would make all the other countries, like uh, in Europe, pay for the war effort. So they were printing tons of money, and and they thought that they would be able to subsidize that printing by taking the the currency, uh, you know, the gold reserves that England had, and all the countries in Europe and stuff. But then it ended up that Germany lost the war and then, you know, they, they had had to pay reparations to to the, the the allies and Germany hyperinflated their currency because they they printed so much of their currency that it it caused prices of everything to rise drastically. So we've seen what happens when you inflate the money supply too much. That's Venezuela, that's Argentina, that's Zimbabwe, that's uh, Weimar Germany. And that's probably not going to happen here because we've learned a lot of lessons. So, you know, there's going to be inflation probably or maybe even deflation, but there's not going to be hyperinflation. I, I think I think there are, you know, our leaders in that way are not stupid. Like they're not going to print so much money that it creates hyperinflation. There's definitely going to be some companies that hi that have hyperinflation or some countries, sorry, that have hyperinflation happen. Um, so it kind of would suck to be in a country that like, you know, has has a weak currency right now already and then going through coronavirus you, you know the comp the country the leaders are, are kind of inept in a way and probably going to create too much money and hyperinflate it i did a couple of podcast episodes on 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 this with uh with friends that lived through hyperinflation so if you listen to my podcast magic internet money i did one with uh, a, fr a friend of mine from venezuela and he talked about how they went through three currencies because they keep hyperinflating them um Another friend of mine, Rodolfo, is from Brazil, and he talked about how he experienced a, a total currency reset. So this is not a new thing. Um, another friend of mine in Israel, we talked about this in my, one of my recent episodes where Israel went through a, a currency, like totally new currency. So I think we've learned enough from all these failed uh, solutions to economic crises that we're not going to have that happen. So, yeah, in the depression, the problem was they were tied to the to gold and they couldn't just create money from nothing. And that's not really a problem. That's actually a way to make sure that people aren't taking too much risk. That's like a way to force soundness and and good, you know, conservative uh principles and to prevent what we see happening now with Boeing and companies like that doing just scamming the public with stock buybacks um, because you can't just print money in a gold backed system. But don't want to get too philosophical here. There's lots of people that would take the other side of that argument. 
but just that's the reason why the depression happened. It's because it's because they couldn't print their way out of the depression because they were on a gold backing. So when the Federal Reserve, uh, sort of uh, the Federal Reserve Act happened in 1913, and it it allowed the Federal Reserve to create paper money. Which is some people still debate that as unconstitutional because in the Constitution it says that states should not are not allowed to create anything and nothing but gold and silver is money, but then the Federal Reserve Act allows the Federal Reserve to issue paper dollars, and f that's why your you know dollars say Federal Reserve note, um, because it's not it's not the U.S. that owns the dollars it's the Federal Reserve. And it used to say redeemable for gold and silver. And that was because back in the 1900s, it was still tied to gold. And you could, you could take it in and redeem it. But then in Franklin D. Roosevelt in the 1930s took the U.S. off the gold standard. So then they were allowed to create money. And, uh, and when they went off the gold standard, they... They were allowed to print their way out. So, so it's different than the depression because we have new. They have new tools. They can like. <laughs> it doesn't make a lot of like. In the end, what's going to happen is they're going to just print their way out of this, and the currency will continue to lose value because since the nineteen thirty three, if you Google, um, like Google. Um, U.S. dollar value over time and just click images, you'll see a chart that shows from the 30s when they went off the gold standard down to now. Like a $1 U.S. dollar has lost 96% of its purchasing power over the last 100 years. And that's because they printed so much of it and it just keeps printing more money. And that's called Keynesian economics. So there's two types of, there's mainly two schools of thought, Austrian economics and Keynesian economics. And we've been on Keynesianism for quite a long time. Oh, somebody's angry at me. <laughs> what am I saying? What am I saying wrong? <laughs> oh, this is hilarious. You can see the responses in real time. Somebody's got a angry face. So Keynesianism is when they they believe that money putting money in supply and the velocity of money stimulates the economy and that creates good times but uh so they they believe that like you can print you can put money into the system like helicopter money basically like what we're seeing right now they're just giving everybody money this is universal basic income kind of is what we're seeing now it's just helicopter money you're just getting money to your bank account. You're going to get money, and then you're going to spend that money on the economy, and that's going to stimulate the economy, and it's going to keep things going, That and that's going to grow the economy. So that is the idea behind Keynesianism. Um, Austrian economics is more like sound money principles. It's, it's more like a value and hard money, so things like gold, and, and like if you save your money and then you create a, a business – and your business creates value, then that stimulates the economy and that you have a bunch of savings and it doesn't punish your savings. So Keynesian policies punish savers because over the time that they're printing more money, your dollars are worth less. Austrian economics rewards savers because your dollar actually stays stable and the value of the money that you're saving is, is staying stable and that's actually worth something. So Keynesians want to target like 2% of inflation a year and Austrians have no, they don't want to have any inflation because they like the, 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 the belief there is that you should not be punished for saving. So it's a, it's a difference in two schools of thought here that like over a long period of time, if your grandparents had bought a bond or something like a lifetime war bond or whatever, or like saved like $25,000 in the bank since they were young and they left it in the bank their whole life or kept that bond, it would be worthless right now. But if they had in, an, in a Keynesian system, but if it was in an Austrian system where it rewards saving and saving is not punished, then you wouldn't have lost the value of saving that money, but maybe we wouldn't have had $390 Boeing stock price. <laughs> maybe it would still be like $10. So that's the main difference between Keynesian, uh, Keynesianism and Austrian economics. And, but the problem is that even Keynes himself said that during good times, you want to save and you want to relax these policies. 
So when we had good times here, we didn't save. We didn't do what John Maynard Keynes suggested. We didn't save. We weren't responsible. We just kept printing and kept printing and kept printing. So now we have hard times, and the only solution is more cowbell. So even the Keynesians aren't doing Keynesianism right. And now what we're getting into is modern monetary theory. And this is a new school of thought that just basically is Jedi mind tricks that makes it so that debt doesn't matter anymore. And that's what we're going to get into. And that's why we're seeing universal basic income, because what's the government going to do? They don't want to see riots. They don't want to see people in the streets protesting and they don't want to have revolts and all that stuff. So they're going to try to like keep us placated and keep us complacent, keep us happy, uh, try to keep the economy going as much as they can. And so they're moving to Keynesianism on steroids, which is modern monetary theory. And I hope that if we do this, it won't be that the the the, the zero point one percent, like the elite bankers, are the ones that make all the money and they get off scot free, and they they're able to get bailed out, and they don't have nothing to 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 like reconcile for. I hope that it's like these people have to take responsibility. They they lose money, they get fined. They're not allowed to continue in the industry. They don't get cushy government jobs. Like after the 2008 financial crisis, Obama hired like a lot of the, the, the bankers that were the ones that were responsible for the financial collapse, taking all this risk in the, in the uh, CDOs and everything. He hired them to be part of the government. So it's just kind of ridiculous. I think it's going to happen again the same way. But, you know, if Bernie or somebody like that gets elected, they're going to use the modern monetary theory and the power of printing money to help people. Free health care. Um, universal basic income, like improving the quality of life of, of people so that they're not living below the poverty line. Things that, you know, you can have a happy life, a healthy life, and, and just have your minimum, minimum needs uh, provided for. And while I don't think that's the way to go if we were just thinking fundamentals, because I don't think that makes sense because you can't pay for that, it doesn't matter because we can't pay for this either. So it, it, it's like, you have to right now we're choosing either bail out all the elite banks and corporations and people that are made billions of dollars off of taxpayers or bail out the people. So I'm obviously going to take bail out the people if, if it's two choices. My, my preferred choice is, a, is an opt out of that system totally. And people go back to like a normal sort of like an Austrian um, way of way of working and, and saving and, and living. But Austrian economics, not Austria in the country. I'm sure Austria, the country is great too. I, I don't know much about it, but we're not in that world right now. And our politicians are faced with, um, our politicians are faced with a situation that they need to just turn the money printers on. And if they don't, they're going to be, they're going to be, it's going to be like, uh, one of the greatest financial problem crisis of our, of our times. And they're probably going to be, not be elected. So these guys want to get reelected. And one way to not get reelected is to let people lose their jobs and, <laughs> and, and like catch coronavirus and die in an overwhelmed hospital. So they don't want that. And I don't think it's, I don't think it's the bad choice because the, op the other option is, is bad too. We, we, we're like, what are we like 80 years on this system of Keynesianism? So the only, like the 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 proponents of uh like the real hardcore libertarians and proponents of austrian economics will say like we just have to take the punishment we have to let the risk get purged we have to let these investors who took all these bad risks fail we have to rip the band-aid off and tell all the boomers and all the gen xers that there is no money in the retirement accounts they're not going to get their pension when they're ready to retire. There's they're underfunded. We have to tell people there is only 1.5% of the insurance fund for FDIC insurance is actually funded. So yeah, you know, if you, if the bank goes under and you know, you've got more, you're, you're, uh, you're guaranteed $250,000. That's what they like to say. And the federal reserve has been sending out, uh, They've been sending out like propaganda videos lately, like, do not take your money out of the banks. We have enough money. You don't have to go to the banks. We have unlimited money. I swear, like, go on YouTube and look for Federal Reserve. <laughs> don't take your money out of the banks. It's hilarious. The guy is terrified. Like, this guy from the Federal Reserve, he's just like, he looks like Xerxes. He's <laughs> from, uh, from 500 or 300 or whatever. He's like, do not take your money out of the banks. We have all the money. <laughs> you do not need to go to the bank. Take out your money. So they're terrified. They don't want you taking your money out of the bank. And honestly, it's kind of funny because my 
I went to, I delivered some groceries to my in-laws because they're, they're over 50 and, you know, they're at the high risk of catching the coronavirus and stuff. So I went out and delivered them some groceries and they were handing me some cash and I had this moment of terror and I was like, I don't know if I want to touch that virus money. <laughs> so, you know, the cash, the cash thing is kind of a, I'm a real proponent for cash, but not when it has viruses on it. But thankfully our, our bills are polymers. So, uh, you can wash that stuff. Um, I kind of went on a bit of a, a rant there. We were just talking about Johnny's question about the, about the, uh, the depression. So that's why I don't think it'll be a depression. Uh, hopefully that helps. Can you guys like give me a, a, a like if that made sense? Cause maybe I, I went on a bit long there. Nice mug. Oh, Kim, if you're still watching, Kim owns the uh, Mugs Coffee Shop in Strathroy, and my daughter made this for me at her store. It says Daddy, and she made it when she was like three or four years old, because she also she runs the, the pottery store in the coffee shop. I love it. And uh, she's also doing pottery deliveries, and she, she sanitizes them, so check out Mugs I don't know the name of the... You put it in the chat if you want, Kim, if you're still here. But support your local businesses. They're having rough times right now. Let's see. Uh, wow, I'm losing... So much stuff is going on in this chat. I'm, I can't back scroll far enough. So the last one I see is... how Ryan, Ryan uh, says, How hard do you think the real estate market is going to get hit? And when do you think the real estate will bottom out? So that's what I was going to talk about. How I think people can get escape this ahead of where they went into it. And actually end up benefiting financially from um, the current like turmoil in the markets. So uh, Kyle says... What are your thoughts on the U.S. creating its own digital currency? What does that mean for other crypto slash digital currencies in your opinion? So, I mean, um, I guess like, the, yeah, the U.S. is trying to create a digital dollar, which the China is also creating a digital yuan. And uh, Facebook is creating the Libra coin, which is a basket of stable coin, like a stable coin basket of like a world uh, currencies. And, and this is all good for Bitcoin in the end. It, it just validates the the use case of bitcoin and people are going to be like oh what's digital money or oh, what's what's cryptocurrency what's stable coin and they're going to go google it and find out that bitcoin is the one you want so i i do think all these things are actually going to be good for bitcoin crypto on the other hand i don't think it's going to be good for crypto because most of those ones are penny stocks and they're more akin to like second or third world uh currencies than they are with uh, uh like bitcoin is like potentially uh, the digital gold, like the a competitor to the world reserve currency. That's what its use case could be in say 10, 20, 30 years. It could be a million dollars of Bitcoin, I think within 10 years, because it can challenge um, gold and the US dollar and stuff as a reserve currency. None of the other cryptocurrencies are like that. Sure, they're more like uh, stocks or, or, or Forex or whatever, where you can gamble on them or like trade on them or whatever, if you have some skills and make some money. But Bitcoin is the one that's like the asset. Uh, Bitcoin is the new asset class. Like there's real estate. That's an asset class. There's cur uh, metals like gold and silver. That's an asset class. There's stocks. That's an asset class. Bonds is an asset class. Art is an asset class. Bitcoin is an asset class. Cryptocurrency is more like penny stocks or, or whatever. So that's the way I think about that. Um, what's up, Hayden? Enzo? Uh, filmmaker friend from Australia there. Hayden is a friend from Ohio. They're having a bad time with coronavirus right now. Liam used to work for Liam at Alphabet. He's watching right now. I think he's in the UK. They're they're kind of going up the up the charts. Uh, we got lots of people that were in. I don't know if they're still here. Um, Adrian said corporate debt has doubled since the 2000, 2008 crash. Man, I would think that would be like quadrupled. Are you sure it's only doubled? Can you go? Can you look that up? I think it's way higher than doubled. Uh, Virginia is watching. She's a paramedic. She's uh she's she's on the front line. So wear your mask, Virginia. Wash your hands. <laughs> Thank you for your service. I mean that's true. We're fighting a war right now. It's really the paramedics and and the nurses and doctors and you know the 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 personal support workers at the old folks homes 
and the cleaning staff at the hospital, like these are the soldiers of this war. So, you, you know, try to do something good for anybody, you know, that works on the front line of this war, because that's really what it is. And yeah, that's what I think of that. So thank you for anybody watching that works in the healthcare industry. Uh, let's see here. Ryan, Aaron, Jerrica, another nurse working on the on the front line. Scott Green, an old comedian friend from Toronto. Tracy's there. Tracy's a really good entrepreneur. She she's a a lovely caring woman who's just always helpful and always listening to people and she runs a call center business. Um, I don't know if she's still here or not, though. I've been rambling quite a bit. I'm trying to get through this back scroll. I can't say hi to everybody, but thanks a lot for all the folks who dropped in. Let's see. And I'll get to the real estate question, too. I just wanted to purge through this list here. More cowbell. Oh, my God. I'm so far behind. Oh, man. Uh... Let's see, Ken Cito, friend of mine from Toronto. He runs a game company. I used to play his game, Zombies. He had, a, he had a location services zombie game where you could like take over spots in your town and build like little forts and stuff. I love that game. It was so fun. It kind of feels like what we're doing right now, doesn't it? Kevin said, uh, great hearing from you and your thoughts. Thank you a lot. Thank you very much. You know, I, I, I kind of stopped doing these videos because I was getting a bunch of hate from, from the public channel I was doing it in people were like messaging me telling me that I'm a fear monger and like masks you shouldn't wear masks and like arguing with me about masks and stuff like that so I kind of stopped for a little bit I'm still gonna try to figure out if I'm gonna keep doing this or not Chris said this advice better be good sitting through a friggin' history lesson here <laughs> just kidding enjoying this thanks Chris uh okay so I'm almost oh yeah here we go Kevin says, I have never been an investor, but I see that once this crisis is over, what should I look at to take advantage of the low investment rates? Liz says, go back to the real estate subject. And Hayden says, game dev, let's talk. Okay, so now I'm pr I, pr I process the back scroll and let's, let's finish it up with what I think you should do to be able to maybe benefit. So I think... The likely scenario that's going to happen because of the coronavirus curve that we're on right now, there's a bell curve that happens. And the top is is like when it's hospital systems are overwhelmed and, and, and the news is, is uh, covering it. Well, the news is covering it now. But so the top is, is like um, the worst, obviously. And then... The, the bottom is like, we got a handle on this. And China is like, maybe here on, you know, they, they went through it and they're here. Italy is at the top right now. And the US and every other Western country are like right here. So there's a couple other countries like Japan, Singapore and stuff that kind of just went like this. They didn't even do the bell curve thing because they had, they handled this perfectly. They did contract, aggressive contact tracing. Everybody's wearing masks. They did, they did open, honest communication with the citizens. They, they turned everything off early and then reopened everything up once they did aggressive, like massive testing. So they didn't have this happen. But we're like right here, the US and Canada, uh, most of Europe. So we had this big, massive drop in the stock market. And a lot of people in the financial markets and on the pundits on TV and stuff are saying the market has priced it in. There's not going to be another drop. The market has priced it in. Well, maybe, but it happens so fast that even even if they've priced it in, and because they there's this efficient markets theory that that basically says that because of all the participants in the markets that it's so efficient that everything is priced in and that when it happens. Um, you know, you'll never be able to beat the market because, you you know, the market prices everything in and you're not smart enough. So just buy indexes and be in it for the long term. That's the philosophy that investment advisors tell you. Like you can't beat the stock markets and, and statistically they're right. But none of them saw this coming. 
None of them saw this coronavirus thing coming, like the significant majority. So that wasn't priced in, and that's why we got this massive drop. So perhaps they haven't priced in the second phase yet either. And just studying every other great crisis in history and looking at the charts, we're not, we had one significantly like, like weak drop, and then it's back up. And that's a typical bounce that happens in these, in these uh, bear markets and in recessions and even in the Depression. It was like huge swings up and down. Like just last week, we had the biggest gain in history since the 1930s. And people were like celebrating that, saying, oh, the bear market's over. It's back to a bull market. Good times are ahead. Well, no, because that's what was happening in the Great Depression, too. So you got to be aware that there's, when there's significant volatility, that's not necessarily good, whether it's down or up. So I think because of the way that coronavirus is going to plateau in the next couple of weeks in Europe and Canada and the U.S., that's going to really put it in people's face and people are going to actually panic financially and try to be selling things. And, and, and then I think we're going to see another significant drop. Once that's over, then it will be time to watch for the recovery. And that's when I think it's time to start redeploying money into the markets. And whether you're an investor or not, I think it's a good idea to put some of your money and like, you know, get get some money into the stock market, like get a good financial advisor. A guy in town here in Strathroy, Trevor Rosborough at Masterpiece Financial is a good guy. He'll take on anybody, whether you got 500 bucks or $500,000, he'll take you on and he's, he's a good guy. So I I recommend him. He's got a good philosophy on it. But, you know, just like anything, be conservative. Don't go all in. If you if you see a massive drop in the stock market, don't just put all your savings into the stock market. Um, Lee said the virus may be in the economic fallout is not at all. So priced in. Yeah, so that's true. The virus it may be priced in, but the economic fallout from all these people losing their jobs over the last couple of weeks and businesses closing down and the airline industry and the cruise industry – you know, and not even the, like there was a one two punch. It was the virus plus it was the, 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 the oil war between Saudi Arabia and Russia happening at the same time. And that really hurt Alberta. Western Canada is like double suffering right now because it costs a lot of money to make oil from uh, like uh, fracking and stuff. It's like 40 to $60 a barrel or something it costs to make. And. And I don't know about much about – that's more like in the U.S. I don't know much about how Alberta's situation. All I know is it's just like they've been hurting for years because of the pipeline protests and all that. And their industry is really hurting. And now because Russia and Saudi Arabia are fighting over the price of oil, it's causing even more hurt. And that's going to cause an economic downturn by itself. Just just the oil war by itself would cause this – potentially this burst of the, of the stock bubble. And – and that's not going to be over for a long time. Russia, Russia said, so it's like the OPEC nations or like the oil producing nations, Saudi Arabia and all that. They have also this OPEC plus, which is them plus Russia. And they, they basically try to agree to like production. So they don't want to have too much oil on the market because then it makes the price of oil go down because there's too much supply. But they don't want to have too little because then it can cause supply chain issues and whatever. So they kind of compete with each other, but they're agreeing to basically fix the price. And, oh my God, Kevin said $5 a barrel yesterday when Western crude oil. Oh yeah, I saw I saw someone post something recently. They, they, they put the, the price of a, a barrel of Canadian oil next to the price of a barrel of monkeys. A barrel of monkeys was $7 at Walmart and a barrel of Canadian oil is $5. Like, think about that. That's insane. So Russia said that they can sit through, they they can sit through 10 years of, of $10 oil. I mean, hopefully that's not going to happen. But my dad posted a picture in Nova Scotia yesterday. He got, he filled up his, his truck for $66, 66 cents uh, a liter. That I haven't seen that since I was a kid. That's just nuts. So... This is strange times, and things are not going to go back to the way they were, and there will be more fallout from this, just like Lee said. Like that's None of this is priced in. Maybe the virus is, but not, not the economic impact of this, not people losing their jobs, not, not the, the oil war, not the inflation in the currency, because when they, when they – like 
people don't realize for the most part that like the government's going to be the Canadian government's going to be given a uh, uh, $2000 a month to people to help support them, right? But where does that come from? That's not like they have the money in the bank somewhere. They they're making that money. That money's getting created. And that has to come from somewhere. So it it becomes added on to the national debt or or just deficit spending and and that somebody's going to have to pay for that. It's it's either future generations are going to have to pay through it through future taxation. So your kids are going to be paying that for their whole lives. Um, or inflation is going to pay for that. Like the currency is going to get so inflated that that will price, that will come into uh, the price of the market. So Lee said, I can sell a dozen fresh eggs for more than a barrel of Western crude. That's just nuts. That's crazy. So, so long, long uh, video to get to the point that I think there's going to be some opportunity to to benefit if you're able to have cash. Warren Buffett has been sitting on the largest cash pile for Berkshire Hathaway for for about three years now. I think it's something like 150 billion dollars, and he's the guy that says you buy when there's blood in the streets. That's his investment motto. It was him or somebody else, but that's what he's echoed that through, through the, you know, he was one of the guys buying up companies and stocks during the 2008 financial collapse. He said, Oh, Warren Buffett's phrase is uh, be greedy when others are fearful and be fearful when others are greedy. So when everybody else is like making bank off Boeing stock at like 300, he's not participating. When Boeing crashes to $50, that's when he buys. So, Warren Buffett and and like um most of these investors know that being in cash is good because then you can you can buy and you can invest when everybody else is hurting when everybody else has too much debt and they're like not able to meet their bills or whatever. So with the real estate opportunity, this is uh if if you have the ability to get some credit right now, to get a line of credit, then then you should definitely do it. And and this is some advice Garrett gave yesterday and I was thinking about it and I think I'm going to do this myself too. So if you have the ability to get a line of credit from the bank, get as much as you possibly can and try to get a lowest rate as you possibly can. They drop the interest rates as low as they've been in history. The, the, the interest rates have never been lower. They, and they're doing this because they're trying to stop a crisis. They're trying to get people to borrow money, small businesses especially. Um, if you have credit, you should absolutely take advantage of, of this credit right now because, for one, this is the lowest interest, interest rate in history. For two, they're probably going to stop giving the credit soon in the next few months because there may this may end up turn into, turning into a banking crisis. It's not a banking crisis right now, but it might turn into that, and then credit might dry up. So if you have the ability to get credit right now, you should get credit. And most of the people that are watching this probably have a mortgage. Um, if you don't have a mortgage, give me an angry face, please. I just want to know how many people don't have mortgages. Uh, if you do have a mortgage, hit the like button. Because I, I, I have a sense that the majority of people have a mortgage. And there's not that many that are, that are just... Uh, not not doing a mortgage okay nobody is nobody's posting likes or angry faces so nobody has a mortgage nobody doesn't have a mortgage <laughs> okay so the the um, i'm assuming people are just multitasking or something all right okay we got one guy doesn't have one guy does all right so we got this is applicable to one person right now now i'm, I'm gonna think this is applicable to most people if What's going to end up happening, I think, is that because we've been in a, a, a real estate bull market and the prices have gone way up over the last 10 years, um, my house is worth double now what we paid for 10 years ago. And I I know like people in my family that have gotten housing, like got, it's got up 50% or something in the last few years. It doesn't make a lot of sense the way that the real estate prices go. But it also... It also um, means that there's a good chance that this can come down a little bit. I don't think it's going to be a housing crisis. I don't think it's going to be crashing down. But 
it's going to probably it's going to probably come down 30%, I think in the next 3 months or so, maybe 6 months, it might take a little bit of time for all, for all this to get factored through the real estate prices. But you just think about it, like the virus spreads in cities easily, right? Cities, it's hard to it's hard to get food, like, you know, you can't grow food in a condo. So, this this is uh this work from home thing is going to catch on and people are going to be like, you know what? I kind of like this work from home lifestyle. Um, maybe I'll go to work sometimes, but businesses especially are going to realize that they don't need all this office space when people are working from home. So that's going to put a lot of businesses in a situation where they're going to be giving up their commercial real estate and opting for smaller office spaces and allowing people to have work from home more. And people are going to be scared in cities of catching viruses and being locked into a city where they don't have anywhere to move around and being stuck in a condo. So not only that, but the prices of real estate in cities are insane. I've got a friend who's got like a, a, a semi house, like a half a house that was built in the 70s in Toronto. And it's not like a, a, a mansion. It's worth a million dollars. Just think about that. A million dollars for a half of a house that was built in the 70s. So that that's unsustainable. Uh, and what's going to happen is it's going to hit the cities hard and people are going to want to sell. So be fearful when others are greedy and be greedy when others are fearful. Now's the time to be fearful in the, in the, in the real estate market in the city. Now's the time to think about moving to a, a different area, honestly. If your house is a, a million dollar house in a city, like you should probably get like a half a million dollar house outside of the city. <laughs> that's probably a good idea. But I'm not giving you that kind of advice. I'm just saying that's what people are going to do. It's going to drive people away from cities. So then the city, the housing, there's going to be a glut of supply in the, in the cities. And that is going to as, as exacerbate the problem with the financial crisis because already people are going to be not able to pay their rent. Um, my friend Kim is, is in a situation already where like her landlord was saying like he's got to move back into his house and she has to go find another house. And she, thankfully she did already. But it was like this coronavirus thing is already impacting people. People are having to move and stuff already. So, yes, they're trying to do some short term stuff for us, but this isn't going to be like for a year. They're not going to like say, oh, yeah, don't worry about your rent for a year because the people that you're paying rent to in the banks and stuff, they, they're going to want to collect money. So when people are losing their jobs and wanting to work from home more and when companies are wanting to give more work from home opportunities and, and let go of their, uh, let go of their, their um, big, huge, expensive commercial real estate, I keep some of it, but get rid of, get rid of it because it's – why do you need so much real estate if people can work from home? So that plus the fear of viruses in cities and, and all this is going gonna, is gonna to spread people more towards a natural life, I think, like certain people. So there's a few factors that work here that's going to cause the price of real estate to go down. Now, Adrian says, would you buy real estate in the city like London? So like a city like London, the prices went up in London because it's, a, it's an effect. It's like a wave effect from the city. When, when, you're, when, when the epicenter, it's like a, a, a meteor of, of price increase hit Toronto. Like a, a meteor of profit hit Toronto. And then the shock wave went out to the cities all around. Because when the meteor hit, which is all the Chinese billionaires that wanted to get out of China and buy real estate in Vancouver and Toronto and UK, like they're hitting all these, these, these big giant golden meteors are hitting the city and causing prices to go up because they're trying to escape communism and, and, and capital controls in China. That causes the real estate prices to go up way up, like so that my friend has a million dollar half a house, right? So that's not, not, that's not natural. That's not natural. So that causes people to sell their house in Toronto to these Chinese investors mostly it, you know, and and in California, it's tech investors. It's like billionaire tech people that cause the price. So it's not just Chinese billionaires. It's also tech billionaires that are <laughs> causing prices to go up in different areas. So that causes people to sell their houses and then move to Hamilton 
or move just on the outskirts of Toronto. And then those people are like, wow, my house was worth 300000 now it's worth 700000 I'm going to sell this, and I'm going to move to London. That's an hour and a half away. So then that causes people in London to say, oh my god, my house went from $250,000 to $500,000. I'm going to sell my house and move to Strathroy, a half an hour away. And so this shockwave just keeps spreading across away from the city, the epicenter of the golden profit <laughs> meteorite. And that causes... The, that causes the pro, the prices to rise everywhere. That in the reverse, when the crisis hits, it's the same thing. The biggest the biggest impact of this financial crisis is going to be felt in the cities because the prices went up the most and they're going to fall the most, and then it's going to be muted the further away from the big cities you go. So in London and Strathroy, I don't think it's going to hit as bad, uh, especially Strathroy, because there's there's a factor that's working well for city for Strathroy, be, which is a lot of these people from the cities are going to want to move to like a, an area where there's more you know more land that they can they can have and and uh get away from the cities and it's more affordable so i don't think it's time to buy real estate in the cities now but i think what you want to do is be prepared to buy outskirts of the cities when there's a bottom in the market and when the prices drop, that's when you want to be ready to buy and you want to be leveraging credit. So if you have, so let me just get through these questions right now. Uh, Johnny says, yeah, that's what I mean. Houses will decrease in value. People are maxed with debt. And if they sell their house, it may be worth less than what's their outstanding on their mortgage. This will create more houses on the market than buyers, which will keep dropping the housing prices. That's the crisis I think is coming. That is the crisis I think is coming, and Johnny, that's why I think now the best idea for people is to refinance. So right now is the time before it's too late to lock in your mortgage at as long as possible. In the U.S., they get to like – so there's this concept of a fixed rate and your term, right? So the term is usually 25 years. But the fixed rate – the fixed rate is – you lock in at this interest rate now and it's locked in for X amount of years. Because we're at the lowest interest rates in history, you want to lock in for as long as you possibly can right now. 10 years is the maximum that we can get in Canada. In the United States, they can get 25 years. If you're in the United States and you're watching this, you're so lucky that you have the opportunity to lock in at this low, historically low interest rate for 25 years. I, I mean, I would do it in a flash, but we only have 10 years here. And basically the reason why that's so good is because you're scamming the banks that are scamming you. And it's because normally I wouldn't think like this, but after talking to my friend Jason Hartman, who has this uh, podcast network and specializes in real estate, he talked me through this. And he's just like me. He's like a hard money guy, an Austrian economics guy, but he understands the scam that the banks are running. And he's like, listen... <clears throat> the banks are going to print so much money over the next 25 years. It's going to inflate the supply of currency so much that the amount of money that you're paying monthly now is going to be nothing in 25 years. So if you're paying $2,000 right now monthly for your mortgage, in 25 years, $2,000 is going to be nothing because they're going to print so much money and the money supply is going to be hundreds of trillions of dollars. So you're paying them back with money that's worth nothing. And so like by year 15, you're, you know, the average hourly wage is probably going to be $200 an hour. So your $2,000 payment is going to be the, the equivalent of like a $500 a month payment right now. So you're locking in for this long term and over time you get the benefit of paying them back with worthless dollars. And because it's a contract, they can't stop. They can't, you know, there's nothing they can do about it. There's people that were like locked in in the 70s for a 30 year fixed rate mortgage or whatever, or say the 80s, that were paying $100 a month on this $70,000 house, right? And, and that $100 a month 30 years ago probably was, was, was felt like a lot more money when, when you know, the, the, the uh, minimum wage was like three bucks an hour or four bucks an hour or something. So you're paying $100 a month to the bank for your $70,000 house, but over 30 years, that you're still paying $100 a month. <laughs> and that $100 a month is worth nothing. And and the house is now worth $500,000 or a million dollars. <laughs> so it's like you're scamming the bank and you're using the long time frame to your advantage because you know they're going to print money like crazy. And you know they're going to inflate the money supply. So lock in for as long as you possibly can 
because at this low, historically low interest rate, because you know that they're going to keep printing money. Because what else are they going to do? Otherwise, it's going to be a bank failure and you're not going to have to pay your mortgage anyway because the bank's going to go under. <laughs> so there's only two ways this can go. It's like benefit for you. There's only benefit for you. And you want to be locking into long-term mortgages right now with these historically low rates. So I'm thinking about doing this with my house because you don't want to be in the position that Johnny just mentioned where the market crashes and then your mortgage is actually worth less than your house. If you've got like a $500,000 mortgage and your house is $700,000 right now and then the market crashes and your mortgage is 500000 still but your house is only worth 400000 that's going to hurt. <clears throat> and it's going to come back probably as, as inflation happens in, in five years or something. But, but a lot of people are going to see that and be like, unable to justify paying that high mortgage for their house that's not even worth what their mortgage is so you don't want to be in the position where where you're where you're like you've got no cash and all you got is this massive mortgage so if you have any room in your house right now you should take advantage of it you should refinance and you should you should take money to your bank account garrett's garrett calls it the three r's uh and this is what he said yesterday, restructure, refinance, and reallocate. So reallocate is a good, just great, smart advice he gave. It was like, try to have at least six months of expenses. So like cancel any unnecessary subscriptions, any frivolous spending, try to pare down on, get your, get yourself into a mindset of, of like, you're ready for this, for whatever hurt can come and try to get up six months of savings. So that's important. But some direct advice that if I can give to anybody that maybe has some room in their house. Let's say you have a house that's valued right now at $350,000 and your mortgage is $150,000. You've got $200,000 of equity in your house that's just sitting there being worthless, doing nothing. There's, there's an opportunity coming. So if you refinance right now and re, remortgage, like take as high as they'll give you get get your mortgage for 250 get that $100,000 or a or $50,000 or you know scale it to whatever your situation is but <clears throat> take that equity it's worth paying the interest on it for the opportunity to come out of this ahead and there's a chance that you may not use it and then you can just pay the penalty and pay it off. Don't use that money for frivolous things. Don't use that money to buy a new car. Don't use that money for like going on a vacation. Use that money to deploy into cheap assets when when this thing bottoms. When this when the hurt really comes and you're the person with money and everybody's looking for a way out because they over leveraged themselves and now they're in trouble and you can come in and you can use that money to buy a second house or to invest in in your retirement or to invest in a local business that needs that you're going to get a good deal on or to even buy the bottom of the stock market or something like you're going to pay like 2.3% interest or something on that money but you're going to have the flexibility to be able to invest it and come out of this ahead. And this could potentially make you tons of money in the future because there's going to be a buy opportunity most likely. <clears throat> now, what, what's likely also, what could happen is they print their way out of it. We don't see a second crash in the stock market and real estate prices only come down like 5%. That, that could happen. It could, it could be that this, this Keynesianism on steroids, this modern monetary theory, this um, fiat money printing, 10, 20 trillion dollar printing exercise we're on right now saves everything. And then we can just continue on with the bear with the bull market with just the, this, this crazy drop and a V shape recovery back to normal <clears throat> that could happen. So even in that scenario, you only lost like maybe a thousand bucks or something. And you still have that big pile of money, a thousand bucks or something in interest. And you still have that pile of money. You can use that for, uh, you know, paying back the mortgage and take the early penalty or whatever. But you don't have to use the money. But you, it's, it's like if you have the money now available to deploy at the bottom, you're going to be in a position that the majority of people are not in because most people aren't going to be thinking like this. So I hopefully, hopefully that's a helpful tip for people. And then I've got a couple of questions here. Adrian said, the issue I've heard is that there were so many applications for mortgages, the rates are actually going up when the Fed rate is going down. Last week, it was uh, around 2.89. Now it's 
<coughs> well, let me look here. Canada mortgage rates. I thought last week I looked and it was 2.1. Um, yeah, you can get 2.24. So, so you can get, you know, maybe your bank is not going to give you the best one, but don't be afraid to shop around. Go to a different bank. Don't go in person because you don't want to catch coronavirus, but call them up. Let's see, you fixed your 10 year, uh, fixed 10 year. Okay, 10 years is more, yeah. So if a 10-year fix is 3.24 right now. A 5-year <clears throat> is 2.24. So 2.24 is, is still really good for 5-year. I would honestly do... I would do the 10-year um, fixed at this point. Let me see if you can put more down. I think the higher you go, um, the lower the rate. Yeah, sorry, I'm just doing some calculations here, folks. He said, Daydream said this was from a, U a mortgage broker he knows. And Jake said, U.S. people, Loan Depot online, just did it yesterday. Really good service online to refinance. Awesome, Jake, that's good. Good to know people are doing this already. Um. Yeah, honestly, to think about this, 10 years, 3.24%, it, it does seem like a scam. Like, the rates are lower than they ever are in history, and yet they're going up. So, that just shows you banks are just trying to milk you for all the money they can, even during a crisis. Just like they did in 2008, they, 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 they socialized your house, and you know, in the U.S. anyways. They socialized people's houses, kicked them out of them, and then got bailed out. So, you know, banks are unscrupulous but you should try to do whatever you can to take advantage of credit being offered right now especially at low rates and 3.24 is still low for a 10-year fixed <clears throat> because i can see if you think about you're paying a little bit higher than you should like one percent higher than you should but the rates are probably going to like the prices are probably going to come down 30 percent in in real estate so it's probably a wash. Like uh, the one percent extra interest you're paying is probably worth it. Hello, Leslie and Mark. What's up, Mark? Mark joined. Uh, Tim said banks teetering on insolvency if they have didn't have zero reserve requirement. I agree with you there. The banks um, in the U.S., not in Canada. Actually, the Canadian banks, as far as I know, are, are doing decently well. I looked at the balance sheet of, of TD, and I think they had significant assets to be able to weather any kind of financial crisis. So I think the Canadian banks are much more conservative than the U.S. banks. But the U.S. banks, yeah, the U.S. banks are in, in a real bad spot <clears throat> because they, they can't even meet the minimum requirements to give people their money and to try and to loan to each other and to meet the 30 days of expected withdrawals. So without going into the Basel Accords and all the, the bank regulations, just suffice it to say that the banks are, you know, people are saying that this is not the same as the 2008 great financial crisis because this is not a banking crisis. This is a, a virus and a real economic slowdown because of the virus. I think that it is a, a, a financial crisis. I think it, there's been uh, cracks in the financial system for for a year and a half now. And we that's a whole other video. I could go on for an hour about that. But <clears throat> this, I was just trying to give people some advice. If anyone has any specific questions about the advice to have cash and to be able to take advantage of this, I'd be happy to talk a little bit more about it or answer any questions. Um thinking through the logic of it just quickly one more time is if you have the room in a mortgage if you've got like say a second home or a car that you've paid off or your if your mortgage is paid off or if you've got lots of equity in your home like 50 grand of equity in your home you should refinance and take that cash you should get a loan on your car you should get a loan on your house you should get money and have that available you should have money available to be able to take advantage of 
the the opportunities that are coming and like how do you know what's a bottom i mean lower than now is better than now so if it goes another 10 20 30 percent lower like doesn't you don't really need to time the bottom you just you just want to slowly conservatively do um investments and and make moves <coughs> and if you want if you want um to say like in a small town like this to buy one house or something for like $150,000, you don't need $150,000, you get a mortgage for it. You put a $20,000 down payment or something. Um and then over 5 years, I'm pretty sure that prices are going to go back up. So so now's a good time to be do to be thinking about doing that and to be thinking about getting positioned to to uh ride this out. And I would also suggest Hey Mark, Pam's back on. That's the third time Pam jumped on. Jason's on. Hey, Jason. Um, I'd also suggest, like, just think about getting a small allocation of Bitcoin because Bitcoin is going to gain from this in the in the medium to long term. Bitcoin gains from central banks printing unlimited amounts of money. Bitcoin is a scarce asset. It's, a, it's the best performing asset over the last 10 years. It's outperformed everything over the last 10 years. There's been no better investment except for maybe like if you're Andreessen Horowitz and you happen to get into the seed round of Facebook, um, maybe you got a better return. But Bitcoin is uh, something I would say everybody should get like 5% of their net worth, allocate to, slowly buy, be conservative, buy dips. Um, it's a It's a wealth... It's a wealth transfer event that happens once in a generation, I think, that's coming up, Bitcoin. There's about $60 trillion of money that the boomers have. And over the next 10 years, that $60 trillion is likely going to be trickling down to the Gen Xs and the, and the millennials. And the millennials are, and the Gen Zs and Gen Xs are more interested in Bitcoin than they are in gold. And, uh, you know, you don't need $60 trillion to go into Bitcoin for Bitcoin to... 100x um if if a small f amount of those people that like boomers love gold and a lot of boomers have gold and and real estate and uh over over the over the wealth transfer that's going to happen from boomers down to the gen x and millennial generation a lot of those people are going to get interested in bitcoin and they're going to buy bitcoin and that's going to make bitcoin go up so as scarce assets start to get invested in, you cannot print unlimited amounts of Bitcoin. You can't print any more Bitcoin. You cannot print gold. You cannot print land. You cannot print, you know, houses. You can slowly build houses. You can slowly mine gold. Uh, Bitcoin has a slow emission schedule over, over 100 years, but... Bitcoin, I mean, but but dollars, the Federal Reserve Chairman or the Federal Reserve Bank recently said we have an unlimited amount of money to print. So because this is in the middle and it's sort of like shock uh, of a financial crisis, people aren't understanding th what's happening and things are hard to process. But what's going to end up happening is that the, the consequence of printing trillions of dollars to stop this financial crisis from happening people are going to have a flight into scarcity into scarce assets so what's the what's the best amount of uh, like what's a good amount to put into real estate and bitcoin and gold and stocks and bonds uh, you know just be conservative you don't want to be going all into anything i don't suggest anybody put all their money into bitcoin i mean if you got ten thousand uh, dollars net worth then put 5% of it in Bitcoin or maybe 10% if you're super young and you're willing to take risks. But you don't need to put $10,000, you don't need to put your whole money or even half of your money into Bitcoin to benefit from it. Just don't, just you know, store it yourself and secure it and think about it as like retirement money. And in 10 years, you know, that, that $1,000 or $500 that you put into Bitcoin could be worth a million dollars. It could be worth a million dollars. 
So it's not likely to be worth that much money. Sorry, no, it could be worth a hundred thousand, a hundred X. I'm thinking in terms of a hundred X in ten years. Um, so a hundred thousand or five hundred thousand. Sorry, five hundred thousand or a million. Yeah. So. Yeah. No, I'm getting this. I'm getting. I'm getting all confused. What are we going? We're going here too long. A thousand bucks. If you put a thousand bucks in, it does a hundred X. That's a hundred thousand. Yes. So if you put 500 in, that's 50,000. So yeah, I'm just thinking if you've got a small net worth, um, but if you have, if you have a larger net worth, like you own some houses or something, then try to get like one Bitcoin, just try to get one Bitcoin. So Justine's on, she's telling me that there's so many green screen backdrop options. Uh, I don't know how to use them. If someone can tell me how to change my background. I, I'm pretty much finished now here, folks. That's all my advice. Hopefully this helped. And this is how I'm thinking through. Conservative. Allocate your money to different baskets. Uh, if you want to read a good book on this, it's it's uh, it's called Unshakable. That's a good book by Tony Robbins. It'll kind of help you go through your budget and trim the fat off your budget. and Like stop wasting money and plan for the future, set some goals. He doesn't ever talk about Bitcoin. I, I talk about Bitcoin though. I think you also gotta, you gotta think about Bitcoin. So hopefully that helped. But right now I'm going to, before I end, I'm going to try to figure out how to change my green screen backdrop. Cause there's a couple people told me to do that. And Justine has a hilarious Instagram account. If you're from Cape Breton, especially you should check out her, uh, Justine, do you want to type it in the chat? Because I can't remember how you spell it. It's a, it's a, it's a hilarious <laughs> parody of a Cape Bretoner stuck in, and she's been doing videos <laughs> stuck in quarantine. <laughs> and it's been funny. It's been good. I can't figure out how to change my background. What's this? Okay. Yeah. All I see is these things. Zoom Zoom has some interesting stuff. Zoom has some interesting backgrounds. And I know how to do that on Zoom. I don't think there is a way to do this on Facebook live video. All right. I can't figure it out. I'm going to end it there. Thanks for listening to me. Uh, hopefully you guys found this helpful. And if anyone has any questions, you can send me a private message. Lots of people have been private messaging me and I've been trying to help out, trying to give some advice and some answers. And, uh, you know, stay safe out there. Practice your social distancing and your physical distancing. Let's obey the the suggestions by our, our, uh, our, our Mr. Trudeau because we don't want Mr. Trudeau using the Emergencies Act and sending in the army to enforce quarantines. Let's be good Canadians and just be respectful of the suggestion to stay at home and avoid all non-essential gatherings. I don't think Trudeau can actually use the Emergencies Act. A friend of mine told me it's because he has a minority government. He would need the Conservatives to agree to that. I don't think the Conservatives will. So uh, I think it's just going to be a lot of suggestions to stay at home. And, and we got to kind of like obey those suggestions because we don't want to lose our civil rights over this. So let's, let's just, uh, practice good, good hygiene, wear a mask. If you got them, they're going to be printing lots of masks. They're going to be making lots of masks and, and, and the messaging is going to change on masks. You just watch. They're going to be saying, yeah, you should wear masks right now. They're saying don't wear masks because they were unprepared for this. And they sent most of our supplies over to China in February, but, and now they're saying don't wear a mask, but if you look at the, the countries that got this under control, they were wearing masks. So you will see them say, uh, oh, yeah, you actually should wear a mask. That's going to be about three weeks from now. Okay, thanks a lot for watching, everybody. And again, uh, I guess if you're, if you're interested in my thoughts, listen to my podcast. It's Magic Internet Money on any podcast uh, uh, platform.